Hey, welcome to Super Social Club. I'm Jeremy. This is Whiskey in the Six. I'm Rob. Welcome to the Whiskey Ramp Podcast. It's a little crusty. It's frustrating. And it's going to be a little bit of a rant. I don't understand it. I don't know why. Some sort of injustice. Anyway, end rant. Hello and welcome back to the Whiskey Ramp Podcast. I'm Jeremy. I'm Rob. And tonight we have some Japanese whiskey on the table here. We do have a lot of Japanese whiskey. I made a lot of enemies saying some things about Japanese whiskey in my first original rant. Really? Yeah. When was this? This was when I did the um, overrated, overpriced. <laughs> yeah. The rant, like the one where I came off of that like like dry month. Oh where right, it's we crusty were as salty hell. Salty as hell. Yes. Yeah. Was so crusty, <laughs> and then I just went off about so many different things. Well, lots of stuff to rant about about Japanese whiskey, namely the scarcity, the supply, and of course the price. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's creeping to no man's land, like. I don't know how many people can afford it, but right. it's just in a zone that's not even reasonable anymore. So we'll jump into that. Also on tonight's show, uh, we're going to get into some topics on Whiskey Tube, but mainly bourbon channels and how the bourbon craze on Whiskey Tube has taken off some of these channels, uh, gaining popularity at a huge, huge clip. So we'll talk on that. Mm-hmm. And related somewhat to that, our secondary market uh, fine tonight. The Red Hook Rye made an appearance on a U.S. secondary group. If you're unaware of Red Hook Rye, we'll let you know all about that. Considered one of, if not the best, American spirit ever bottled. Yeah, the legendary Red Hook Rye. I've heard this story many, many times from our good friend Peter White. <laughs> Everyone wants to get a pour of that. Uh, super limited, of course, and we'll let you know how much that bottle went for on the secondary because it sold for quite a large amount. Terrifying. <laughs> uh, so let's start with the Japanese whiskey. Um, our value whiskey tonight. Is there a Japanese value whiskey? So our almost value whiskey <laughs> of the night is the Hibiki Harmony. Hibiki Harmony. So this is a blended Japanese whiskey, non-age statement. Um, Hibiki has since dropped all of their age statements. Um, but this one we found, I mean, I bought this for a hundred Canadian dollars at the LCBO. Now you see prices of this increase to $130 at the LCBO. But as far as we're concerned, this might be the value buy as far as quality to yeah. price ratio. Yeah, I think it's the most consistent. I think a lot of people swear by it. Mm-hmm. That's when they're referring to Japanese whiskey, they're referring to this one. This is not a single malt, right? This is a blended it malt. It is a blend. It's a blend uh, of different uh, grains, right? I, I think there's... Um, says with a C, I can't remember the name, but they're also owned by Suntory, and they're in here as well. And that's a non-barley, I believe, uh, producer. I'll throw up a graphic just to make sure we're right about yeah. what is in this, but yeah, definitely a blend. Um, what do you get on the nose on this? I really like this one. Yeah, so when we first opened it, there was like a ton of like vanilla and maybe like even a hint of like a lavender kind of like note yeah there's like some floral aspect to it there's definitely like some multi characteristic to this mm-hmm. lots of um vanilla Zero. as you said yeah like cereal grain in there and then it's the almost top. getting like to like a meaty there's like a meaty element in there somewhere i don't know maybe that's the smoke that there's you're... a touch of smoke in this i believe yeah. there's just a little little bit of peat um very very faint but yeah. if you if you dig hard you can find it and then on the palate on this thing lots of viscosity that's the first thing i noticed Mm -hmm. drinking this is like how viscous this is um bottled at what 43 percent yeah 43 abv um the amount of viscosity you get at that uh at that proof is is quite impressive yeah and then like this like coconut note to it Mm -hmm. Uh, lots going on with this whiskey yeah absolutely there's something maybe a little youthful on the palate i get Mm. but other than that and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I like that little like challenge you get, that little yeah. fight back. Like at forty three percent, it drinks a little bit higher in little, my opinion. A little bite on there yeah. as well. So yeah, high. lots going on with this whiskey. Um, so like we said, it's hard to find a value Japanese whiskey nowadays Absolutely. with all these prices going up. Um, you recognize this bottle, don't you? The Hibiki Seventeen. So funny story about this bottle. I bought this off of a dude from the U.S. Um, and I got a great price on it. Well, a great price at the time. Uh, it was like 170 American, which, 170. which was actually really good at the time. Yeah. So 170 ish American. I can't remember exact details, but brought it in, popped it as soon as I got it. Yeah. And what was it like? Two weeks later, 
the Hibiki uh, Yamaza- Yamazaki, was it Yamazaki? I think yeah. it was, yeah, they announced that they were dropping. And Hakushu announced all their they're HDs. dropping all their H. Well, I, I believe Yamazaki still produces the 18, right? But. Hibiki officially dropped all their age statements. Right, they were discontinuing all their stuff because at, of at that point their stock was low. They couldn't keep up with demand. So the bottle that I opened, which I had huge expectations for, which I was a little bit disappointed. I'm not gonna lie, but that's also probably because my expectations were so high on this one. Went from 170 to what, like 650 or 700. So I overnight. remember watching this happen on the secondary market over a two day span and seeing bottles sell for 500 bucks, 600 bucks. You know, so then people were asking 700 and selling them. They got, it got up to almost, I think, a thousand dollars US for the wow. Hibiki 17 before it came back down to earth and settled like around 600 or so. I think where it is now, 600 yeah. or 700. Um, but yeah, it went nuts right when, uh, right before you cracked this. Yeah, right after I right cracked, after you cracked right it. Right after I cracked it. And it's funny because at the time I was trying to get the 12 year old, and a lot of guys were saying, no, I'd rather give up my 17 year old than my 12 year old. Yeah. And so the 12 year old was like highly touted. Yeah. And we were just looking up some prices on that. Yeah, you look at Scotch Whiskey Auctions, the UK auction site now, and, you know, the 17 year old going for, you know, between 270 to 300 pounds, and the 12 year old, almost the exact same price. Yeah. So yeah, it's crazy. To see that. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder why that is. It's got to be much better, I guess, right? It it has the hype around it, so maybe it could be one of those. Yeah, I mean, like the sales of Japanese whiskey in general. I mean, I remember it going down to the states and seeing a Yamazaki twelve on the shelf for yeah. ninety dollars. Yeah, US with Hukushu was like eighty bucks. Sure. I mean, still kind of expensive, mm-hmm. but now you're looking at you know almost two hundred fifty US dollars. Yeah. For a Yamazaki 12, if you can find it. I don't see them that often, to be honest with you. I remember going down to Florida and walking by the Huk- like It was just easily accessible on the shelf, 80 bucks, And I was like, eh, dollar was at par. Mm-hmm. I wasn't interested. Walked past it so many different times. Right. And then, yeah, I don't know. what. Like, I ended up trying it, and I really like it. I, I think it's one of my favorite Japanese whis- whiskeys that I've tried. I do like this one quite a bit as well. Uh, but, I mean, it's just insanely overpriced now so how did we get to this japanese whiskey craze i think you can cite jim murray's whiskey bible review 2015 where he named the yamazaki sherry cast it's 2013 release yep best whiskey in the world first time he named a japanese whiskey giving that award and then the snowball started rolling i think at that point in time it, it it's crazy the power that jim murray yields in that whiskey bible like yeah whether positive or negative, he can inspire an entire nation slash world to run out, go buy an entire shelf of some whiskey, right? Like we just saw that with Alberta Premium Rye, mm-hmm. a whiskey that we both liked well before Jim Murray talked about it. Yeah, and then a whiskey well, we featured on this podcast, actually. Yeah, we did, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, it it ended up being the whiskey of the year this year, and now you can't find it anywhere. So we won't get into the current Jim Murray controversy. That's for another time, I think. So yeah. we'll leave that one sit. Um, yeah, we're going to avoid what we don't know. We're going to leave alone. Like We don't know enough about it to, to comment. So. Sure, we'll leave that for another time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really, I think that you saw Japanese whiskey prices. I mean, I'm sure they were going up before then, but it kind of hit the mainstream at that point in time and really put a spotlight on Japanese whiskey, especially that Yamazaki, which goes for crazy prices now. I'll throw up uh, a graphic on current UK auction prices for that. We were so close to having a Yamazaki 18 in hand. Remember that? We, like, we, we were in oh, a couple yeah. lottos. We yeah. won, but we decided not to... Oh, there was a buyout. Yeah, we decided not to buy it out because yeah. there was like four, three people in the lotto. And then mm-hmm. like essentially the way these lottos work is if your number is hit, but the lottery didn't fill, then you have to pay for the rest of the spots. You don't just get the bottle. So, so all these, uh, there's a ton of spots and they would have ended up being almost like what the secondary price was on that bottle. So it would end up costing us like 400 or so us or 500 us or something. Which maybe we should have done because now you can't (laughs) get it for, yeah, it's like what? $900. I don't know. Us. It's, it's about 900 bucks us. I saw the last time. So I've had a very small pour of it and it was delicious. I'm sure it's great. Uh, is it 900 no. US great? Like, no. I don't know. It's I don't, not. 
I, we've tried better whiskey, I think. Yeah. And for a lot less. So another issue with Japanese whiskey is that nowadays, are you getting Japanese distilled whiskey mm. in your Japanese bottle? How terrifying is that, right? Like, there's no rule that says that they can't bottle other countries' whiskey and call it Japanese whiskey. That's exactly right. So in Japan, there's really no regulation as far as being distilled in Japan and then being called Japanese whiskey. They can bring in, they can import whiskey from other places, bottle it in Japan, call it Japanese whiskey. I remember getting some heat about this in that overrated overpriced as well, because I do mention this. Mm -hmm. And guys are like, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and it's, it goes back to like when people start talking about that 0.09% mm -hmm. rule of Canadian whiskey. Like a lot of people get that wrong. They don't understand that that 9% or that 0.09% or whatever, sorry. 9.09. Uh, 9.09, sorry. Yeah. Um, it has to be an alcohol. Like it has to be alcohol content. Like a lot of people are like, oh, you can just throw juice in there. You can. Just, that's not true. Right. right? So yes. maybe... Maybe there's some of that going on in Japan as well. Like maybe they can't officially call it Japanese whiskey on the bottle, but it's from these Japanese distillers, right? Like we have an example right here. Uh, what is it? Nika? Bottling. Yeah, so Nika, um, the company that owns them, owns Ben Nevis. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what you're seeing now is you're seeing some Ben Nevis distillate in these Nika expressions. So I think what's happening is like, these Japanese distilleries, Japanese whiskey producers, taking advantage of the Japanese whiskey craze right now, like yeah. how expensive these bottles are going for, can't necessarily keep up with demands. So they're bringing in other whiskey from around the world and blending it with theirs and, and shipping it back out. Yeah. Um, I, I find it very interesting that people are just so obsessed with Japanese whiskey. And like to the point where now nobody's releasing these age statements anymore so i don't know is can you still get this nika 21 year old is i'm not sure this is a, these are a lot of x rob bear bottles <laughs> over here uh the the hakushu i traded for a whole bottle so i this was mine originally right? Right. i got this from uk auction and then i traded it to you yeah and then you did some damage to it and then, and then somehow it got back either to me. i traded back to you or i gave it to you <laughs> couldn't remember that one might have been like one of those like late night whiskey gifts that I just like let you leave with. Grab or, a bottle. Yeah, yeah, just take a bottle. It's I call them whiskey bomboniere. If you're Italian, you'll know what that one, <laughs> what that one means. If you've been to an Italian wedding, um, the Hibiki 17. I think I also traded to you, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, once yeah. I brought it down to halfway or something like that. Yeah. And then same with the Nike 21. Yeah. That's like I don't know if it was halfway or what, but. So, if you look at global sales of Japanese whiskey, so Japanese whiskey selling outside of Japan up 9% annually, which is double American spirits, Canadian spirits, Irish whiskey, Scottish whiskey, double that. So the That's growth insane. is just crazy. Yeah. I mean, and the prices come right, right behind it. So I guess... Globally, that's like the whiskey of choice then. That must be. If that's the case, then like people are choosing to drink Japanese over most types of whiskey out there, right? It's crazy, right? Like how the popularity just is on this like ever climbing curve. I mean, and you so, look at people who collect, I mean, just, you know, yeah. the value of these collections, these portfolios of whiskey just ever, ever going up. Well, we have a collector's item on the table tonight. Can we talk? Can we give them a little sneak peek? <laughs> yes. So this is something super, super special. Tell them what we got here. So we got the Karazawa 1981, 35, 33 years old. Yeah. Um, distilled 1981, bottled 2013. This a was malt a... malt reviews, Narby, just like unbelievable yeah, gift. Yeah. So if you're not aware... Um, one of our biggest inspirations in whiskey tube uh, malt reviews mike and narby they yep. have a channel that specializes in um we say like very highly collectible museum piece uh whiskeys i think museum piece is the right term right. like they i think i don't know if they coined that term but they, they did I, they may have coined that term uh that's the right way to describe their channel their their initial review their first review was a dalmore 50 year old yeah that was the, it was like around christmas 
Dalmore 50 year old I'll never forget that um, just two really down to earth really cool guys that drink some incredible whiskey just epic stuff all yeah. the time uh, super Nardi nice guys was uh, super generous and gave us a sample of this um, bottle that's 60.3 ABV it's a first fill sherry cask uh, like we said 33 years old 33, 34. Um, one uh, of the most sought after collectible brands right now. Yeah. They, honestly, uh, Jeremy looked at me like I was cheating on him when I smelt the no, like they smelt this. He's like, you started without me. <laughs> How dare you? It's like the way my wife looks at me when I watch an episode of a show that we're watching <laughs> together. <laughs> um, the nose on this is dare i say for the first time this year bonkers like <laughs> oh i mean holy this smokes. is out of control dude that's stupid that is stupid i mean you get that old sherry in this you know like yeah oh man i almost <sighs> i almost feel bad ranting about japanese whiskey tonight <laughs> while enjoying something so legendary and epic so Kawasawa, they bottle a lot of their stuff all single cask. This one is a single cask, uh, 240 approximate bottles. Cask number uh, 6056. You're looking at secondary market prices, um, you know, around 3,000 or so pounds. You know, this is a $5,000 bottle almost. Unbelievable. So like what hurts the most about that is that like it's just after this sip, it's basically unattainable like right. we'll never ever see this again in our lifetime we're gonna have to pause the podcast for uh for sipping <laughs> go to that screen wow that's insane that finish is out of control it's just like i don't know where to start because there's like a million things happening here so it's funny because I remember watching this review on their channel specifically, and I think it was Mike that said this is like dinner and dessert all in like one dram. Yeah, that's not a bad way to describe and it. And it's a great way to describe this because like it starts with this like almost like gunpowdery. Um, I was just going to say that. Like, like, and then like leads into like a meatloaf almost. Right, <laughs> like yeah, a, it's like very meaty. Like a gravy, something like very like. But and this this is gonna sound like terrible to some people, but it's it's phenomenal. Like it's ridiculously good. And then it gets sweet, and then there's this chocolate and dark chocolate and like a little bit of milk chocolate and coffee at the end. There's like a little bit of like saltiness, almost like kind of like. Uh, mm -hmm. And soy, I'm still soy tasting sauce it. Almost. Yeah, soy sauce is a good one. I'm still tasting it. I, I, like the finish is unbelievable like it's 60 percent, so it's it's a high abv right but was it 60.3 or 60.4 60.3 yeah unbelievable this, first time ever experiencing this distillery before yeah i didn't i'm not gonna lie I, I had no idea that this distillery even existed to be honest with you some of these expressions from this distillery go for crazy crazy money so like it, it begs the question, these guys are all taking a break on no age statements. McAllen did something similar to that. Now McAllen is coming out with every type of age stated whiskey you can think of. They have a triple cask. They have a double, no, triple oak, double oak, single oak, mm -hmm. right? Does that mean these guys will eventually start coming out with age statements again because they've taken such a long break? Like it's been, what, three yeah, years now? I think so. I mean, you take a look at the whiskey boom in the last five to seven years, every single distillery is ramped up production. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure, you know, in another five years, you're going to be getting 10 year old, 12 year old whiskey starting to come out like McAllen is now. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, where are we looking at the future of Japanese whiskey? Is it going to be back to where it was before? Price is going to go down. I, mean, I don't see prices going down. That's the thing about once you've established a price in the market, you're really going to go below? I mean, I guess if it gets saturated that much, maybe, but... Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's disappointing because, like, like we had already said, like, three of these bottles were once mine. <laughs> um, 
the other one that I managed to acquire before everything like hit the brakes was the Yamazaki 12 year old, mm -hmm. which is also a very good whiskey. Um, but we were just getting like to start going down that rabbit hole when everything like, you know, fell off a cliff and there was no longer age statements and everything was way too expensive. I remember uh, South Florida Pete Lovers bought a bottle of Yamazaki 18 year old for like 200 bucks. Yeah. No, it was less. It was less than... He I think they got it for like 125. Yeah, it was, it was less than... The, I remember he was comparing it to the Macallan 18 year old saying that for like 100 bucks more he would have to buy the, the <laughs> Macallan 18 year old sure. or whatever. So imagine that. In... Six years, a bottle went from $125 retail to now $900 on sites that are probably charging a little bit of secondary price on that. But I don't know if, like, are they still producing Yamazaki 18-year-old? I don't know. I, I have no idea. Like, That's a good question. I, I don't know, and I haven't seen it on an American shelf retail. Right. So... And what is retail on that bottle if it is being produced now? <laughs> no, there, it's just constantly fluctuating, right? I don't know. I mean, the future of Japanese whiskey, it's so unattainable that you, what are you going to do? I mean, look at Ralphie. He's even like boycotted reviewing Japanese whiskey because of the prices have just got out of control. Yeah, it's disappointing. Like, I understand when, like, it's, it's the, you know, supply and demand. And, like, I keep getting that thrown in my face when I like knock a Japanese whiskey but none of these whiskeys in my opinion warrant anything north of $200 in my opinion yeah. that's uh, of course that's just my opinion yeah no but I agree none of these warrant and I'm talking like okay so let's say 200 American just to to make it level the playing field but each one of these except for the Hibiki Harmony of course is going for well over that, mm -hmm. well over that now. So I think I saw, the last time I saw this on a shelf, it was $800 Canadian, yeah. the the Nika 21-year-old. Uh, so what do you, they're not, they're not, the quality is not of that caliber, but yeah. they're being praised at that caliber. Yeah, and then you're getting all these other Japanese whiskeys that are coming into the market at lower prices, but they're just not that good at all. Right. Like. That Toki or whatever one, yeah, you know, it's how much is it at the LCBO? Sixty five dollars or so, 70, something like 70 that. Bucks. Yeah, not very good at no. all. I think there's a a fifteen year old version that's three hundred dollars at the LCBO. It's a fifteen year old. What what fifteen year old have you experienced in your lifetime retail that's three hundred dollars? Yeah, I know, right? There's none. There isn't. There isn't one. Uh, I think the closest thing that comes to it is the McAllen fifteen year old, which is two hundred bucks now. When it was first released a year ago, it was 150. They jumped the price 50 bucks because I guess they had to be more expensive than all their no age statement whiskeys. So, three hundred dollars for a 15 year old? Uh, there's no way I'm gambling on that bottle. Yeah, it's easily the Japanese whiskey. You're either at the entry level spirits, which are not very good at all, or you've got to go all the way up yep. to buy something that's that's decent. I mean. This, I guess, is like the value buy, right? I don't know how much it is in the U.S. market. I mean, the LCBO bumps it up 30 bucks, But for $100, I would be uh, recommending a purchase for that. $100 Canadian. Yeah, I think, I think you could still get that in Alberta it. for 100 Not Not at the LCBO, but it's, it's worth a try. It's worth going down this road once just to say... Uh, I tried a Japanese whiskey. Sure, like what's the Japanese whiskey profile? Yeah, I think that for a hundred bucks is a good experience with it. It, it captures it well. I, it's a blend. Keep that in mind. But I just wish this stayed the same price because at eighty bucks, which was expensive at the time, mm -hmm. it was still worth the eighty bucks. Yeah, I mean that the uh, Yamazaki twelve was great. Yeah, the so for those of you just listening, I'm pointing at it like a dummy and not realizing that you can't see what I'm pointing at. So I'm talking about the Hakushu 12 mm -hmm. and the Yamazaki. I actually reviewed them on my channel head to head, um, and I, I thought they were both great whiskeys. But I got them both for sub hundred uh, US dollars, right? Yeah. So. Uh, there's that. Yeah, and I mean, I guess with Japanese whiskey now, it's like buyers beware, right? Because you're not necessarily getting 
Japanese whiskey in your Japanese whiskey bottle. Right. I mean, we reviewed that Mizunara cask, which mm-hmm. was not good at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, expensive. Right. Young. As soon as you put Mizunara, it's like, as soon as you put the word Mizunara on a bottle, it, you just increase the value of that bottle like a yeah. hundred bucks at least, if not more. If, if it's a scotch with a Mizunara on it, mm-hmm. it's, it's at least a hundred dollars more than the standard release of that bottle. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I think know. Japanese whiskey not really on our radar for buying. Like, when's the last time you bought a bottle of Japanese whiskey? Uh, right here. Right. <laughs> what was that? Three years ago? At four least. years ago? Yeah. Four years. I, I, ago, I won't. I, I refuse. I I want to try the Yamazaki eighteen year old, but not at a thousand bucks. I know it's not a thousand dollar whiskey. It was a hundred and twenty five dollars retail at one point, mm-hmm. and, and we're not talking like twenty years ago. Yeah. We're talking five years ago you know what i mean like yeah i mean it's just it's just not something i'm looking to buy right now i mean even like that nika from the barrel which is a 500 ml bottle right and like that's another thing are they gonna go with these like half liter bottles that are charging 750 milliliter prices like it's just it's just an area of whiskey that uh is on the back burner for now for me anyway yeah like a lot of people swear by that nika from the barrel but then I have like people I trust calling it a hot mess. You yeah. know what I mean? So there might be some batch variants. I reviewed it on my channel. I thought it was okay. I think I gave it an eighty six, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't buy this again at one hundred and thirty bucks. It's decent, but I think you can get a better Scotch for sub one hundred bucks. Sure. Right. Yeah. You can definitely get a better Canadian whiskey for sub one hundred bucks, and you can get a better American whiskey for sub one hundred bucks. Right. So why am I going to buy this bottle? I, I think that's what I want you guys to leave this conversation with is why buy, why spend more on Japanese whiskey when there's several other countries making better better whiskey for less? Yeah. I mean, unless you're balling out and buying like auction bottles, which are super, super epic and super high quality. Like the Karazawa here. Like the Karazawa. But again, like, yeah. you know, it's you know, $3,000 uh, 3, pounds at auction. You know, that's the level that you're looking at for something yeah. like that. Like, the Kurosawa is worth selling a child for. <laughs> but you're not going to do that about... Like, you're not going to do that with any of the whiskeys other than this on this table. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's just unfortunate. I mean, like, Japanese... Good, really good Japanese whiskey is just for the wealthy and the collector at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the whiskey tube topic tonight. And this was a Patreon request from Jesse... He asked, why do we think that bourbon channels on YouTube get so much popularity and grow uh, so quickly? So I got the short version and the long version of that. Go ahead. So I think it's like 60% of my viewership is American. So Americans consume a lot of YouTube, A. That's a statistical fact. Yeah, and I'll throw up a chart right here that that shows that. Yeah. Yeah. Bourbon is their home brew. You know what I mean? Like that's what they're making in their country. So obviously they're going to be patriotic towards it. Side note: Americans are patriotic. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> I think uh, I think that's kind of the uh, <laughs> most obvious thing that anyone could ever say. Sure. Americans are patriotic. They love their bourbon. Yeah. And they are going to support America. I've literally had people comment on my channel oh shit this guy's canadian i'm out of here yeah <laughs> <laughs> like literally like verbatim i'm not exaggerating someone uh, has come on to my channel and said shit this guy's canadian i'm out of here sure i mean yeah you don't go to you know your dentist to ask about cooking advice yeah you know you want it from the from the head so the the chart i threw up um leading countries based on numbers that watch youtube united states this is in 2016 um, 167 million people. Wow. That is almost three times the next leading country at about 70 million. So yeah, they consume more YouTube obviously than anyone else in the world. Yep. Bourbon is the national spirit. Um, so yeah, I think that you look at YouTube statistics, like subscribers for these channels. Um, you know, it's Bourbon Night. You know, uh, over 60,000 subscribers in four years that they've been on. Bourbon Junkies, which are blowing up huge right now, you know, 37,000 subscribers in about two years. Uh, Mash and Drum. Our boy Jason. Mash and Drum. 26 and change now. Yeah, over 25,000 in two years of work. Um, The Bourbon Night, almost at 20,000 for three years. So, yeah, I mean, like, 
these bourbon channels definitely get lots of notoriety, lots of popularity really quickly yeah. because you know you can go to a lot of these shelves in the U.S. and find exactly what they're talking about. Whereas a Scotch, you know, maybe a little more scarce rarity. Um, yeah, there are there are a lot of American uh, Scotch drinkers, which is our fan base. You right. know what I mean? That's the sixty percent of my fan base are American Scotch drinkers, pretty yeah. much. I mean. Both of us do a pretty decent job. I think we, more than anybody else, do a variety of whiskey. Yeah, I think like for our channels, whiskey is the theme. Yeah. And it's just whatever we think is good, whether it be exactly. Scotch, bourbon, Canadian, or other. Exactly. Um, you know, we focus Japanese. on... Japanese. Japanese, we focus yeah. on Scotch maybe first and bourbon right behind it. Yeah. Um, Canadian whiskey's in there sometimes, Irish whiskey. Yeah. I really love, like, it doesn't matter what where it comes from i'm well you guys know i mean it's no it's not a secret that i'm a big fan of indian whiskey and yeah you know so one one area i would like to explore more is australian whiskey but it's just so damn hard to come by here that's the thing right like what can you get in your area like that's really you know the main thing yeah uh, (laughs) it's what blows my mind the most is the Patreon support of some of these <laughs> these YouTubers, right? these, these American yeah. bourbon tubers. Yeah, I think they need a ca- a category of their own. Like they can't be whiskey tubers anymore. They're bourbon tubers. Sure. Because like, you have a bourbon channel, it's gonna blow up probably. Like you're what are the, how many bourbon channels are there now? Probably a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean. The guys that are putting out great product have been recognized for such and have huge subscriber bases, yeah. huge Patreon support, um, and all the power to them, man. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, bourbon is huge. Here's some stats. Uh, 2017, um, sales of American whiskey grew $250 million to $3.4 billion total. That's an 8.1% uh, increase that year so i mean it's just it's it's going crazy it wouldn't even make sense for us to focus our channels on bourbon even if we loved it even we, if we, it can't was get, like, we can't get all the bourbon we can't right? get how many store picks are there none right now in the u.s like probably in every store like there's a, a store pick right? yeah. any any store that's like that knows a thing or two about whiskeys decided to do a store pick yeah. you know how many store there's, picks of bourbon does the lcbo bring in Big fat zero. We had we had those makers mark ones. Does do those count? Like I, I don't even think those count. Like like even the SAQ in Quebec did a store pick of uh, Jack Daniels. The Jack Daniels single barrel barrel proof. We didn't get that. No. Alberta got one. Alberta can. Alberta does picks. Alberta does Other provinces some great, do. Yeah. Ontario they don't give a shit. No, they don't care. They 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 care about the bottom dollar in Ontario, and it really affects it. It affects us because they could be doing so much more. Because of their buying power, yeah. and bringing in some incredible stuff and making lots of people jealous, but they don't. LCBO. Let's throw a tick on the LCBO sucks uh, wheel. Uh, can, we give, can we give them two a negative? Roll two? another one. Roll another. Because <laughs> um, they just suck. Yeah. But I'm just wondering when the the bourbon junkies are going to give me credit for the top six. I don't. Like, right. They keep using this top six. People keep biting your stuff left, right, and center. Over, over. It's called whiskey in the six for a reason. <laughs> That's why I do top six. Otherwise, it's top five, top ten, yeah. top twenty. That, those are the generic ones. Why, Bourbon junkies. Why is Mash and Drum doing your overrated, overpriced? He's doing it too, right? man. Yeah, you know what? They're taking all the credit. I'm gonna call them Milli, the Millie Vanillies <laughs> of of the YouTube world. <laughs> right? God. <laughs> Taking my material. But, uh, no, like, awesome for them. Like, I think, like, the buddy system, too, it seems to work well, right? Bourbon Junkies, uh, it's Bourbon Night with Chad and Sarah. Yeah. Um, that kind of back and forth that you can kind of give with someone else seems like The it's... whiskey rant? <laughs> <laughs> sure, whiskey rant. Uh, yeah, you look at, like, uh, Whiskey Tribe. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's like, that's some, some more entertainment value rather than just one person on camera. Yeah, I have a hard time going live by myself. Like, I... I don't find it's fun for me. Like the flow has to kind of yeah. Be like it's me. you're in a room and there's dead silence. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I, I enjoy that like back and forth when you're over or whatever. You know what I mean? Like 
so absolutely I could see why they're more successful because people want to they want to see two guys shooting the shit or they yeah. want to see you know Chad and Sarah have been doing their thing from day one and mm-hmm. it was cool like watching them grow and like as friends and then into a couple and all those other shit. things right so um, yeah I think the the, the duel works you know mm-hmm. there's a reason why Batman and Robin were <laughs> so popular <laughs> So who's Robin? <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to be Robin in the no. Batman Robin scenario. So let's not answer the question. Uh, <laughs> throw it in the comments down below if you want to uh, see what one of us is Batman. <laughs> All right, moving on to our last segment tonight, the secondary market finds. Let's stay with the American spirits. I saw a bottle of one of the most renowned, one of the most expensive, and one of the most collectible American spirits in history red hook rye yeah so i remember hearing stories about this for a very long time Mm -hmm. and how when it first came out do you know what the retail on this was when it first came out it wasn't that much so what you want to tell the story about red hook rye so there is a small liquor store i believe in brooklyn new york Mm -hmm. called linnell's and it was owned by um uh, what's her face Tanya Linnell, I believe her name is. Yep. Um, so yeah, small independent store. Um, she got really involved with the spirit game um, and did a barrel pick of some epic, epic Willet 23-year-old and 24-year-old um, whiskey, um, bottled it under the Red Hook Rye name, which is the uh, part of uh, New York where her store was. Um, so I think what makes this Willet so good is that one it's super old like 23 yeah. years old yeah um i believe the mash bill is 51 percent rye so it's just a barely legal rye yeah um and they recast it so they had it in i believe virgin oak and they recast it into an ex bourbon barrel and those ex bourbon barrels must have been epic because what people say about this is just absolutely phenomenal stuff yeah this one came up on auction you want to guess how much the asking price was Oh uh, man, I, it's got to be north. Well, I've heard that it goes up to thirty thousand American, but I think I'm gonna say less. I'm gonna say like what? Right. So 20, the asking price was twenty five thousand. There you go. And it sold for twenty four thousand. Jesus. So imagine you bought that retail. You just put your kid through college with <laughs> with a bottle of whiskey, like. Congratulations. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and there's a really good episode on the Bourbon Pursuit podcast, which I suggest everyone who's interested uh, listens to, because they have Linnell on there, and uh, you know she talks about the whole process of these picks, and she did four barrels. I mean, I don't know how many bottles total. I think it's around 850 out of the four barrels that she did. Yeah. Um, really interesting to hear her story about, you know, starting up grassroots uh, liquor store and like, you know, some kind of a sketchy part of New York at the time and like how it just gained a popularity and how she brought in all these unique, unique bottlings and kind of the whole story is really, really interesting. Can we legally drop a clip of that like real quick? Just yeah, of course. Out. Fair use. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. So take us through selecting that whiskey. What? As you know, there were four barrels, and um, the first barrel, Drew and I, with a couple other folks, were just in the warehouse, literally, like, just walking over barrels and popping bongs and tasting whiskey and passing it around. I'm like, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And that number one is still my favorite of all four barrels. I mean, you know, it was really just being able to pick kind of the cream of the, the crop, the the um the barrel was phenomenal yeah we'll throw it right there um yeah it's like her and uh fred minnick and the other people from Bur- pursuit really interesting really good podcast uh, so definitely check it out so yeah um probably the most expensive american whiskey for sure um yeah so i well what's the new eagle rare go for yeah that goes for a lot too almost twenty thousand. right yeah so it's in a couple of years That'll probably, and that's mainly just because of the decanter, because like the liquid, nobody even knows. No, <laughs> like, honestly, I don't even think the, the master distiller doesn't even know because he's yeah. like, yeah, let's just bottle that in the, like the fanciest dist- like <laughs> thing you can find, and we're gonna sell this for ten grand. Well, I think like the rarity of Red Hook too. I mean, there's only what they did four barrels, eight hundred and fifty out of all that, yeah. so we have two hundred ish 
200 and change from each barrel. I mean, it's crazy. you listen to this podcast. She doesn't have any left. They're like, how many how many bottles you got left? She's like, none. She's like, <laughs> she tried, she sold all of her remaining stock to um, invest in different uh, endeavors. But I mean, there could just be very very limited. You know, like a, a handful of bottles left of this circulating. Yeah, I'm gonna steal my buddy uh, Dave's line and say she's not a bad girl for wanting to you know make a little coin off of her initial. Uh, creation. You yeah, know? I like, mean, if anybody deserves it, it's her, right? Yeah, I mean, she had the uh, the palate to know, you know, walking through Willett's warehouse and be like, oh, what's this one? And then picking, you know, what she thought was the very, very best. And yeah, I mean, cool that Willett even like sold her those. Yeah, and uh, bottled them under under her name because I mean, according to her, those were their their best bottles. And like, how often do you get? A twenty-three or twenty-four-year-old rye whiskey. Yeah, it's that it's that serendipity moment, right? Like, it's what made Bullmore Black become what a fifty-thousand-dollar bottle, and like, yeah. it's it's those bot like it's that Macallan ten-year-old cast rank that was once eighty bucks on the shelf. You know what I mean? And now, like, try to touch it. How much would you pay for a pour of this? Realistically, if this Red Hook Rye. Red Hook Rye. What would you be willing to throw down? Just to say I did it, can yeah. we do it like on the channel or like, because it, it does matter for me if we were able to record this experience. Okay, so let's say that someone opened a bottle, they were selling ounce pours, and what would you be willing to pay? I'd pay a thousand bucks. I would say a thousand dollars. I'd pay a thousand bucks. Yeah. I'd pay a thousand bucks. People are looking at us like we're insane <laughs> right now. <laughs> but I, you know what? Like, you're talking about a literally. Like, and this is what bothers me about American whiskey in general. This this probably can go towards what we were talking about earlier of Japanese whiskey as well. They call it limited, but it's coming out every year. So really, is it limited? It's not can limited, right? right? It's 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 a yearly release. Yeah. Pappy, George C. Stag, uh, William Lear Weller, all the BTAC stuff. These are yearly releases. These are annual releases, meaning they have enough stock that they know they can release this every year. Yeah. And we're not talking 10 bottles. We're not talking 100 bottles. We're not talking 2,000 bottles. We're talking... 25,000 plus of George C. Stag, at least. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think at some point, like a, one, like a couple of years, they've had like 50,000 or whatever. You know what I mean? Like There's an insane amount of bottles coming out. And obviously, there's more bourbon drinkers than there are bottles. But we're talking about... A rye that only had eight hundred and fifty something. What was it exactly? Eight hundred fifty for the four barrels, right? So yeah. about two hundred or so. And this was batch one that sold, so it was the batch one, and okay, regarded as the the best one. Right. So batch one, eight hundred and whatever about bottles, like two hundred twenty five bottles, probably. Crazy. So, yeah, yeah, I would pay a thousand bucks for that jam, yeah. but I'll never pay that for pretty much any other bourbon <laughs> no i mean like just to say that you've tried red hook rye yeah. you know very very few people have that honor yeah um so it's kind of something kind of cool mm -hmm. yeah yeah no it's definitely the people that love rye this is what they obsess over like this is their unicorn the bottle that they've dreamed about for years um i know our good buddy peter white has talked about this time after time mm -hmm. with me and uh you know he he longs for it right yeah. so I, I could totally see why he would pay maybe a thousand bucks for a shot of that i mean i've had uh, a nine-year-old will it will it rye uh paid i think 45 dollars a pour for it wow very expensive bottle yeah absolutely loved it there you um, go i mean i can't imagine something 24 years old 23 24 years old that's insane and not just that but also I think that the way that they they recast it, you know, listening yeah. to uh, Linnell talk about that was really what maybe put this one in the honey barrel category, as they say, you know, like the cream of the crop, the top yeah. of the top. So I really like when bourbons do that. I really like when like ryes are done that way. Like I, I love Michter's toasted barrel stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I do think that that's there's something to that and and if Michter's comes out with a Michter's toasted barrel rye that's 20 years old i think people would literally kill each other for it like there would be like yeah. a riot to get that bottle because i love it at 
like the no age statement probably only five six seven years old Mm -hmm. maybe a blend of that yeah so i can imagine all right well that's gonna do it for us let's mark the um hibiki harmony what are your scoring this bad boy so i do like it it's not making me want to go buy a bottle to be honest with you um although this is our bargain technically we should be like it, guys it was, it was hard for us to figure out a japanese whiskey that we could highly recommend that's a value pick uh if you have to try a japanese whiskey if that's like on the bucket list go buy this for 130 bucks i'm gonna give it an 83 i think okay i'm 86 on this and i think that the hundred dollar price point it was justified. I know it's 30 bucks more now. Yeah. Um, if you want to get a Japanese whiskey of good quality, I think this is probably where you're going to have to start. I mean, I think that all the stuff that's on the lower shelf now is just not worth it yeah. at all. Yeah. You know, you're not going to be disappointed. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what uh, what's out there. Maybe there are some gems. We haven't tried them yet. That's true. I mean, like we said before, is there a value Japanese whiskey right now? Yeah. It's hard to pick one. Right? I'm hoping that company... I. I yeah, the, the name eludes me right now, but I'm hoping that company that we tried that sent us a bottle, we didn't love that whiskey, but they're confident enough that like they're sending people bottles and they're trying to get their name out there. So maybe they're going to produce something a little bit more to what we're hoping for. Let's hope we can get some Japanese whiskey uh, that's good quality at a fair price, but uh, we might have to hold our breath a little bit more on that. What would you score that Kar- Karazawa? <sighs> I don't know. That's a tough one, It's eh? got to be one of the best whiskeys I've ever had. I mean, like, the thing I like about this is that it's constantly changing, and you yeah. get new notes every time you nose it. You get new notes every time that finish hits you. Mm-hmm. That's where I put a high score yeah. on some whiskey. So. so just do it for fun. Everybody's wanting to know. I mean... It's a very, very safe 95 for All me, right. at least. Cool. I mean, like, just going back to this nose now is, like, just blowing me away even again. Yeah. No, it's crazy. It's... Like, epic. the nose now is just... It's 96. I'm going 96. 96. I'm That's the highest score I think you've ever given, right? I'm going 96. I mean, this is just out of control. Good. It's, it is epic. It is epic. It's everything I like about it, right? It's, like, it's heavy, thick sherry, yep. and it's got this complexity to it where it's super unique. Like, this is not, like, a whiskey I've had before. No. The only thing... You know what it does remind me a little bit of is that Mortlock 31-year-old that we bought. Mm. That, that G&M Mortlock, I honestly don't think people know enough about how good that is. Yeah. Because you get that like that old dusty sherry, right? right that old kind of dankiness to yeah. it. Yeah. And then you can, yeah. You can take this the it age. reminds me of it a lot, actually. Like, they have a lot of similarities. I bet you if you had them side by side, people would think they're from the same distillery. And now, like that finish is all like cinnamon. It's like Christmas cake. It's it's got everything. This yeah. thing is just crazy. Yeah. It's I absolutely would. crazy. So, so uh, we should hit up Mike and Narby and see what we can do to <laughs> buy the rest of that bottle. Yeah, how much do you want to sell that for? You bought it at retail, you can give us a good price. Right, give us a good price on the, <laughs> on the, on the last third of that bottle and, and uh, we'll call it a day. At least we'll get a little bit more and we can actually do a review on it. Yeah. Well, well what are you scoring it? Just throw it out there. I, I don't think you're far, I, I mean, it's, I hate having to mark something on one pour. On one pour. Yeah. But if, if this is the consistency that you you would expect from that entire bottle, then yeah, you're you're right there, like 95, 94, 95. Crazy. I'm there too. Absolutely insane. Yeah. All right, well, that's gonna do it for us. Thanks so much for joining in. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, check out the podcast on uh, all major uh, podcast streaming services. If you're listening to this on that, check out YouTube. We review whiskey there. Um, so until next time, guys, have a good one. Cheers, guys. Cheers.